So we'll get started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum of 2021. My name is Tim Bruno, and I serve as the Chief of the Office of the Great Lakes for Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And I'm joined here by Sarah Stallman, the Extension Leader for Pennsylvania Sea Grant's Erie Office, as well as Sea Grant staff, Kelly Donaldson, who will be helping with our uh, facilitation of the Zoom meeting today so everyone can participate. Lake Erie and the surrounding watershed play a significant role in the economic vitality, cultural heritage, and overall environmental health of the Erie County and the surrounding region. Recognizing this, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection organized the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum, commonly known as PA LEAF, as a way to provide related environmental and regional information to the public, and also to engage citizens in the process of environmental protection by providing the public with the opportunity to share local insights, information, and opinions. Today we'll be focusing on a, a very important issue uh, of environmental justice and equity and how we as a community and a region can ensure that all races have a role in public policy decisions and considerations. But even more specifically, how we can actively include members of our society that have experienced a history of injustice and marginalization. It's important that we get this right as we move collectively forward with crucial public uh, infrastructure uh, improvements, how we address pollutants in our environment, and how climate change affects our community, as well as how we build our local economies. So today you'll hear uh, the following themes from our presenters, how our history, our water infrastructure, and how environmental justice issues directly influence water affordability in the Detroit metro area, as well as places across our Great Lakes, and how a committed local organization is helping to overcome those challenges. How environmental justice is being coordinated on the state level in Pennsylvania, and how the Department of Environmental Protection is working to increase the voices of citizens across the Commonwealth. Additionally, we'll see how Sea Grant and both Minnesota and Pennsylvania are seeking to conduct planning for climate resilience in traditionally underserved and marginalized communities. So now at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Stallman at Pennsylvania Sea Grant to describe some of the features of our online meeting and how everyone will be able to interact with the presenters as well as learn some more about Pennsylvania Sea Grant. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Sarah Stallman. I am the extension leader with Pennsylvania Sea Grant. Um, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with Sea Grant, but just for those um, who might be new or not sure what Sea Grant is, um, we are one of 34 Sea Grant programs around the country. Um, we have offices where we work statewide. We have offices in Erie, the Harrisburg area, and the Chester area. Um, and ultimately, our goal is really to promote the sustainability of Pennsylvania's coastal resources. We do this um, through science-based research, education, and outreach. And so for the past several years, we partnered with um, DEP um, to organize these PA LEAF meetings. Um, typically, these are held twice a year in person um, at the Tom Bridge Environmental Center. As we all know, uh, COVID-19 threw a wrench into things and we needed to start pivoting to a virtual format. And this virtual format has really helped us to be able to reach um, a broader audience. Um, so there's, there's good along with uh, bad and missing everybody's faces and seeing everyone face to face, but we're able to get a lot more people on board and reach um, kind of a farther geographic scope here. This is our second virtual gathering. The first was held in March, um, which covered a variety of uh, regional water quality topics. And so details, including a recording of that webinar are available at seagrant.psu.edu forward slash PA leaf. And I can um, put that into the chat for folks as well. So just a couple uh, housekeeping items before we get started. Um, Tim's going to be introducing and providing a brief background um, for each of the speakers. Um, participants are muted, um, but we are encouraging you to please participate by using the chat to ask any questions um, that will be answered at the end of each of the presentations, and Tim and I will work together to moderate those questions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and the link is going to be shared broadly um, within a couple days, and also it'll be available um, on the, the LEAF website that I just mentioned. 
So unless I'm forgetting anything, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it back over to um, Tim to provide some Great Lakes updates. Excellent, thank you. And, and so I'm gonna keep my updates short for today because we have um, three segments that I wanna ensure that we have plenty of time for uh, to listen from our presenters. Um, but, but firstly, just a, a few items. Um, to, if you have not heard about the Office of the Great Lakes for Pennsylvania DEP, we are the central connection to um, the rest of the Great Lakes states, provinces, and the two federal governments on the lakes. And we help coordinate Pennsylvania's representation to uh, several different interstate um, compact agencies, as well as organizations that help provide governance anywhere from water quality to water use um, and a host of other issues. Um, that being said, if you'd like to learn more, I encourage everyone to visit the PA LEAF website uh, online. Um, and there you can see former presentations uh, of our meetings. Um, and also you can learn more about the Office of the Great Lakes, Pennsylvania Sea Grant, um, as well as get a host of other information uh, about our Great Lakes resources. If you'd like to do that, you can visit it at seagrant.psu.edu slash P-A-L-L-E-E-F, P-A-L-E-E-F. Um, just to cover a, a few water quality uh, updates that have occurred over the last three months, with the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which is the binational agreement between the U.S. and Canada that covers a host of water quality issues, anywhere from lakewide management to uh, chemicals of mutual concern, nutrients, climate change, um, and science on, on the Great Lakes. Um, there have been a few developments. On uh, June 29th through 30th, uh, the Great Lakes and, um, Executive Committee had a, a chance to meet, and that's the governing uh, body of uh, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. They received updates um, on nutrients on Lake Erie, uh, as well as the 2020 loading uh, estimates that were made available um, via the Erie Stat website on the Great Lakes Commission's uh, Blue Accounting website. This is a, a great resource where you can um, go into it. Uh, it's, it's very self-intuitive. Um, you can find out what each one of the jurisdictions are doing on Lake Erie to reduce nutrients and try to meet the loading targets that were set um, by all the jurisdictions uh, uh, over the last five years. Additionally, we're still waiting as the states um, on the updated Lake Erie Lakewide Action and Management Plan. And this has been um, eagerly awaited since 2019, but there have been delays um, in finalizing it. And I believe that EPA has assured that that is in the final stages now. And we hope that by the next uh, Lake Erie Environmental Forum, we'll be able to present some of the items from the finalized uh, Lake Erie LAMP. Additionally, the 2021 Presque Isle Bay post delisting sediment analysis that's scheduled as part of um, the, the post delisting requirements of the remedial action plan uh, for the former area of concern. Um, DEP is preparing to do uh, the sampling that's associated with that. There has been a hiccup though, in that the Canadian border has been closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so as the, uh, the border begins to open over the next month, I know that our biologists are currently planning to uh, do not only those samples that are necessary here in Presque Isle Bay, but also the reference sites that they have um, across, across the lake um, on the other side, on the Canadian side. And um, on a water use uh, update, uh, Pennsylvania is currently assembling its uh, 2020 water use data for submission to the Great Lakes Commission, who coordinates uh, the data submissions from all of the jurisdictions, both uh, uh, the state jurisdictions, both on the United States side, as well as the provincial side on the Canada side. Um, and they put that together uh, for the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources uh, Compact Council. And, um, and, and so uh, upon those submissions, uh, I think at our next meeting, we'll be able to take a little bit better look at our 2020 water use in Pennsylvania. And I think we'll see some interesting trends um, and some uh, artifacts of the COVID-19 pandemic 
that um, may be playing out in how we use water here in the region. And so that should be interesting and I look forward to that uh, coming up. With that, there have been a, a numerous um, solicitations for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. This is a, the pot of federal monies that is appropriated by Congress um, to, uh, to uh, increase water quality, habitat, um, et cetera, across the Great Lakes. Um, most recently, there have been solicitations on the reduction of non-point source pollution, as well as implementation of green infrastructure. And those are things that the Erie community uh, may, greater Erie community may be able to take advantage of. If you have further questions, please contact me and um, we'll be able to uh, discuss those. So without further ado, what I'd like to uh, do at this time um, Sarah is, is, is introduce our, our first speakers um, that we have here today. And I am going to bring that up. And so as I mentioned before, our special focus topic um, for this forum is environmental justice and equity. And our first talk is the crossroads of environmental justice and water affordability. Understanding history's role in water affordability in the Detroit region and rising to meet a contemporary challenge. And we have two extraordinary speakers here today for, for everyone. And uh, I'd like to introduce them. The first is, is Monica Lewis Patrick. She's a uh, president and CEO of We the People of Detroit and I really did have the pleasure of, of meeting Monica a couple of years ago and really talking about some of the work that we, the people of Detroit, is doing um, on the water affordability issues, uh, as well as water quality issues and drinking water um, across that region there in M Michigan. But Monica Lewis Patrick is an educator, an entrepreneur, a human rights advocate, and along with other four founders of We the People of Detroit, she, with the leadership and volunteers and community experts, placed herself, as well as that organization, at the forefront of water justice struggle in Michigan, across the country, as well as globally. Monica is known throughout the uh, environmental justice community as the water warrior. Indeed, she is. She is actively engaged in the struggle for access to safe and affordable water for all under-resourced communities. And with her today is Emily, Emily Kudel. Uh, Emily is a professor um, and a designer and a researcher. Um, and uh, she works as a professor of architecture at Lawrence Technical University. She's a member of We the People of Detroit, the Community Research uh, Search Collective, and coordinates Black Bottom Street View. Previously, Emily was the 2019 to 2020 Rainer Bannum Fellow at the University at Buffalo. She holds a BS in architecture from the University of Cincinnati, as well as a master's with high distinction in the certificate in museum studies from the University of Michigan. And so um, Sarah, I think we'll need to transition the, um, the pictures over to Monica and Emily. Emily, I think, I think you need to make me a co-host so I can share my screen or enable screen sharing. I'm gonna see if I can do that. I'm not sure. Kelly, are you working on that? Oh, there we go. Got it. All right. So. All right. Well, first of all, let me say peace and blessings to all of you. And we're so grateful to be here with you today. Uh, Tim, uh, we had no idea that we'd still be uh, having this conversation. And actually the need has even grown since those years ago when we first talked about water affordability and giving some historical context to how Detroit got into condition that it's in. Uh, and I'm so honored to be here also with my teammate and one of the co-founders of We the People of Detroit's Community Research Collective, 
And Tim, you'll know this story because we talk about it often. Uh, the next slide, please, Emily. Is that my background is as an educator and a counselor and a therapist. I'm a trained therapist. And it wasn't until uh, 2010 when we were working for the Honorable Councilwoman Joanne Watson, who is the uh, legislative architect, along with the late, great Marianne Mahaffey, who was a uh, social worker and a white woman in the city of Detroit, but she deeply understood the need to address poverty and inequity. And so those two women, along with Michigan Welfare Rights, along with People's Water Board, but along with the great Charity Hicks, led a struggle uh, that has been ongoing for the last two decades to fight for the human right to water, clean, safe, and affordable water in the city of Detroit. And so that's one entry point for we, the people of Detroit. The next slide, please, Emily. The second point for us, and all the women you see here are the women that I serve with, uh, but if you look at the woman in the middle, she's 90 years young, and Mama Chris Griffith, uh, one of the stories she talks about as the mother of nine children is struggling to keep water on in the city of Detroit, where water rates have increased over 438% in the last two decades. But then the other stories we heard from women like Professor Aurora Harris, who's standing right beside me, who is fighting for uh, the issues pertaining to uh, public education. And what we found is that there was a crossroads between water inequities and water injustice and shutoffs and even public education. But then to the left of Mama Chris Griffin, who's in the middle is Cecily McClellan, who for over 25 years served in the Department of Health and Human Services. And she actually created the template, the program for DWAP, Detroit Water Assistance Program, that was successfully providing some relief to Detroiters to keep their water on. And then at the opposite end of me is Deborah Taylor. And Deborah Taylor's legacy is deeply connected to the struggle in uh, connected to the Flint water crisis. She was a part of that small delegation that went to Flint from 2014 to 2015 to help capture the stories of the people of Flint that lifted it along with Kirk Guyette and other media experts to what we now know as the legendary Flint water crisis. But all of us came together really fighting for against the injustices and the inequities that we were seeing in the city of Detroit pertaining to public education. And then it grew into the issues that we saw connected to the inequities of water inequities, uh, of water justice and lack of access and affordability. The next one, please, Emily. This year is Cecily McClellan, and again, I think it's just so critical to lift her up because it wasn't just the crafting of the policy for water affordability, but it was then having a champion inside the department, the city government, to leverage those federal dollars and make sure that they were meeting the needs of residents in the city of Detroit. And so we just can't say enough about Cecily because even till this day in retirement in the city of Detroit, she has been a critical point of connecting resources and leading us at the water rights hotline. We, the people of Detroit for the last seven and a half years has had to physically deliver water door to door because of this injustice that Emily is going to lay out for you through maps and through data. But we didn't initially start out with maps and data. We started out just trying to figure out why was it so punitive that our government was shutting our water off, knowing that there were so many thousands of families that could not afford water. Why was there no pathway? And why was the government at the local and state level doing everything in their power to deny residents in the city of Detroit access to an infrastructure system that they not only had paid for and invested in, but until this very day, we're still on the hook for. The next one, please, uh, Emily. And then this here, I wanna connect you to the right now work that we're doing at We the People of Detroit. We could not just stop with delivering water. And we could not just stop with the work that Emily is gonna guide you through with citizen science and data and research. But we had to find ways to make sure that we were connecting it to the activism that youth were wanting to lead. And part of the things that our children told us is that as we're sitting in these rooms with you and you're talking about water shutoffs in Detroit and Flint, or you're talking about toxic water or PFOS, we're actually experiencing these inequities and injustices along with you. So our children asked us to invest in something called We the Youth of Detroit, which is now connected to a greater global movement 
that is moving throughout the Great Lakes that is now called the Great Lakes People of Color Water and Policy Center. And so young people are leading on these issues because in places like Detroit, where we have seen water inequity and injustices to the tune historically of 438%, where we have seen water rates triple in Chicago, where we're looking at in Toledo, where water rates have gone up over 40% in the last year and a half. And right before COVID, Flint was on pace to seeing its water rates double. They pay some of the highest water rates in the country, $250 a month on average. And they're looking at their water rates doubling to about $400 a month. But it was young people that said, not only trauma, not only inequities, not only racial injustices, but we wanna be a part of bringing ingenuity, creativity, and bringing justice back to our community. So we're so grateful for the work that they're doing. But at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Emily Koodle so she can lead you through the science and the research and the data that has been so brilliantly done by We the People of Detroit's Community Research Collective. Thank you, Emily. Take it from here. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so uh, first I'll just say a couple of things about our community research collective. Um, we are a collaboration between community activists, academics, um, researchers, and designers. Um, and we uh, research a whole range of issues that impact the citizens of Detroit. Um, and really our goal is to produce research for community organizing purposes um, and to advise legal and legislative policy um, in order to build a more democratic city and a more democratic water system. Um, we are interdisciplinary and intergenerational um, and most of our members wear multiple hats. Um, so our members who identify as activists are also, um, you know, retired professors or currently working professors. Um, and so we, uh, we work in a lot of different roles and we conduct multiple types of research um, from data collection and visualization to public health research. We focus on water education and land. And we're really interested as Monica was talking about earlier and how these systems overlap and affect each other. Um, and so we work in collaboration with a whole ecosystem of other social justice and environmental justice organizations, both in Detroit and regionally. We use our research for community education um, and we also support other community organizations with research and data. Our research has been used as evidence in local statewide and national legal and legislative work. In our work, We the People of Detroit leads the research and controls what we do with our data, making decisions about what to study, how to do the research, how to frame it, and how to use it. Um, and really, this is an intentional inversion of the way that academic research can sometimes happen, where academics and institutions come into a community and have total control over the research that happens. Um, so for us, it's really important that, that, that our work is controlled by a community. Um, I'm going to use research from our 2016 book, Mapping the Water Crisis, to give a little context about our water affordability crisis, and then I'll share some more of our recent research on water access and public health. As Monica explained, the city of Detroit has been conducting large-scale mass water shutoffs for non-payment of bills since 2013. In Detroit, we have about a 40% poverty rate. Our water bills have increased 120% in the past decade, and like Monica was saying earlier, over 400% in the past two decades. Our water department has an extremely harsh shutoff policy. It shuts off water to accounts that are 60 days or $150 overdue. This practice is not only cruel and inhumane, but it also puts the health of the entire city at risk. In fall 2014, the United Nations found that the city was violating basic human rights regarding water and housing. But the city continued the water shutoff practice until it was forced to stop during the pandemic. In the past 10 years, about 170,000 families have had their water shut off in Detroit. We estimate somewhere between 10 and 40% of the city's population or between 63,000 and 270,000 people have had their water shut off by the city of Detroit in the past 10 years. You can see that the geography of people most impacted by water shutoffs in Detroit looks like a hollow donut 
with the outer neighborhoods being most severely impacted and the central downtown area, which is currently receiving tremendous amounts of investment, um, is largely untouched by shutoffs. This crisis is not limited to Detroit. In a, in a pre-pandemic study in 2017, a Michigan State University researcher named Elizabeth Mack found that over a third of Americans were at risk of losing access to affordable drinking water by 2022. So that's triple what it, what it was at the time that the research was conducted in 2017. So just imagine how that crisis has been exacerbated by COVID. Detroit has a vast regional water system, one of the largest water and wastewater systems in the world. It's an old system with its oldest components built in the 19th century, and it requires extensive maintenance, including the replacement of countless lead soldered pipes and lead service lines throughout the system. Um, and those are of course concentrated in the oldest city center parts of the system. The cost of that system is then redistributed to its customers in the form of high water rates. And as you can see, the water system stretches all the way to Flint, Michigan, which is 60 miles away from Detroit. So that gives you a sense of the kind of size of the system. Our infrastructure is political as well as physical. And it has a history that involves a hundred year long struggle over control of this region's water. The city of Detroit built, maintained and operated the regional system for a hundred years as the water system expanded to facilitate and subsidize the growth of Detroit's suburbs. Without the regional expansion of Detroit's water system, Detroit's suburbs simply could not have been built. In 1955, the water department manager, Lawrence Lenhart, warned that if Detroit agreed to these regional expansions, it would ultimately bankrupt the city. Obviously, he was overruled and the system continued to expand. Historically, Detroit sold water to these other municipalities at wholesale rates, and then those municipalities would mark it up to retail rates, as you can see in the diagram, and, and keep the profits. The power struggle between the suburbs and the city, which has really characterized the history of our water system, is fueled by racial segregation and racist narratives. As a result of that power struggle, we at We the People of Detroit have to debunk deep-seated misconceptions and myths surrounding our water infrastructure. Misconceptions that are really inextricable from racism, segregation, and the removal of democratic control from communities of color in Michigan. In Michigan, we have an emergency manager law which allows the state to suspend democracy in communities that are struggling financially. An emergency manager can override the mayor and city council, can create and end contracts, and can reorganize city government, which happened in Detroit. This is a map of race and emergency management in Michigan. And you can see that the places that have experienced emergency management are almost exclusively majority black communities. Our wastewater system is also vast and centralized. We have a combined sewer system and regionally our water is treated at one massive wastewater treatment facility in Southwest Detroit. This facility is located in the most polluted zip code in the state of Michigan. In heavy rains, our system is overwhelmed. Just last week, we suffered devastating flooding across the region and most of the worst damage landed as it usually does in the city of Detroit. The largest failure in the system was the failure of the Connor Creek pumping station, marked with the largest pink dot on the map on the left. It's the highest volume CSO control facility in the city and the pump stopped working during the downpour, flooding basements across the east side of the city. So Detroiters bear the majority of the impacts of our regional flooding and our centralized system. Detroiters also pay the majority of the costs of the regional flood infrastructure. In 1999, DWSD federal oversight judge, John Fikens signed an order that 83% of the construction costs for any CSO control systems must be paid for by Detroit residents and the remaining 17% paid for by suburban wholesale customers. The 83-17 split is for non-Detroit only and non-common to all facilities only, meaning that Detroit residents pay for 83% of the cost of CSOs that only serve suburban customers. Detroiters pay for 100% of the cost of CSO control systems that serve Detroit customers. 
Within the system, the residents of Detroit contribute the most revenue to the regional control system, while suburban residents contribute the least. Detroit's Water Department was under federal oversight for 36 years, from 1977 until 2013. When federal oversight was lifted, the city was under the control of an emergency manager. Emergency managers catalyzed both the Detroit and Flint water crises at the same time, while the city of Detroit was in bankruptcy. Large-scale mass water shutoffs began under an emergency manager in Detroit, and Flint was removed from Detroit's water system and poisoned under an emergency manager in Flint. If you're looking at a graph right now of water shutoffs in Detroit per month from 2010 to 2015. Um, and as you can see, the time periods of emergency management are marked, and you can see really how water shutoffs spike in Detroit um, directly after the emergency manager declares bankruptcy on behalf of the city. Um, you can also see the overlap between the escalation of shutoffs in April of 2014 and the removal of the city of Flint from the Detroit system um, during that same month. Flint was Detroit's largest wholesale customer. Its removal from the system weakened Detroit's finances and helped to justify the transfer of control from the city of Detroit to the Great Lakes Water Authority, which has majority suburban leadership. Um, and so now we have a regional Great Lakes Water Authority, which manages um, the regional system, which was constructed by the city of Detroit. We also understand that water shutoffs are not isolated incidents. Water shutoffs are connected to tax foreclosures, displacement, and school closings in the city. In Detroit and many cities like it, unaffordable water has had a massive impact on Black homeownership in a city that once had one of the highest rates of Black homeownership in the world. So here you're looking at a map of homes that were auctioned in 2014, where water bill debt contributed to the foreclosure of the home. Um, so auction in the tax auction. And in, the, in this map, you can see the darkest purple areas. That means that 12 to 26% of all of the homes in that area were auctioned in one year in 2014 because water bill debt contributed to the foreclosure of the home. So this is a problem that doesn't just stop at removing people's access to water, but is also actively displacing people from their homes. One of the most effective uh, angles of research that we have been working on um, is our public health research um, and trying to make a case, a public health case for affordable water in Detroit. Um, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, recognizing the extent of water insecurity in America, states across the country stopped shutting off water. In this act, they acknowledged that access to running water is a fundamental public health necessity. Given this recent acknowledgement of the critical connection between affordable water and public health, we are really right now in a critical moment to move policy at the local, state, and national levels towards water affordability. In 2016, um, our research collective worked with researchers from the Henry Ford Health Systems to do a pilot study on the relationship between water shutoffs and water-related illnesses. Um, so we were looking at skin and soft tissue diseases and gastrointestinal illness. Our research showed that people who were diagnosed with water-related illnesses were one point, almost 1.5 times more likely to live on blocks with water shutoffs. We found that the inverse is also true, that people who live on blocks with water shutoffs are 1.55 times more likely to get a water-related illness. So this was an initial pilot study, um, and unfortunately the research was discontinued by Henry Ford after he um, completed this pilot, um, but it's showing this really concerning link um, between, between water shutoffs and, um, and, and, and disease in the city. Um, we have conducted multiple statewide um, surveys, um, which are adapted from a Center for Disease Control Method for assessing public health after a natural disaster. Um, so it's called the CASPER method, um, where we're looking at randomly sampled um, city blocks across the city and going door to door and asking um, a range of questions about um, water shutoffs and how this man-made crisis of mass water shutoffs is impacting public health in Detroit. Um, and so here you can see some of the findings. Um, 
we're seeing even with this completely random example of survey that we did, um, that 17% of the households that we surveyed were or had been shut off from water. Um, and 26% were had been shut off or were currently at risk. Um, we completed another study with um, in, in collaboration with the Brightmore Food Pantry to look at the psychosocial impacts of water shutoffs on um, people who are at risk. And um, we were looking at how all of the emotional symptoms that we were seeing show up in our previous study, um, if they were in fact an effect of water shutoffs. Um, and so Essentially, we created a scale of water insecurity that was ethnographically grounded in water use practices and perceptions. And then we weighed that against a widely used and validated measure of mental health um, called the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale. Um, and uh, just full disclosure, I am not the person who coordinates the public health research that is Nadia Gaber, um, who's a medical anthropologist um, and is currently getting her MD. Um, uh, so she's the one who coordinates all of, all of this public health work. Um, so we surveyed 100 low-income residents at a food pantry in the Brightmore neighborhood on the west side of Detroit, um, and we found a statistically ca significant causal effect, um, not only among those who had been shut off, um, but also among those who said their water bills were not affordable. Um, so a causal effect between um, the risk of water shutoff and all of these mental health symptoms that we were finding. Um, some of the other really striking um, water health related health behaviors that we found, um, a third of these women that we surveyed reported that they had collected water from an undesirable and dirty source. More than 80% worried that they would not have enough water to meet their needs and were drinking water that they believed was unsafe. Um, when 75% of um, people are fearing that CPS might take their child away if they found out that water had been shut off in the house, you have a lot of people who are really hiding the fact that their water is shut off rather than getting in line for any kind of government assistance. Um, most recently, we have been studying the relationship between COVID-19 and water shutoffs. Um, and so this is a preview of work that we're working on publishing right now. Um, and uh, I'm highlighting the period of time that we were researching on the left, so in that kind of heavy black box there. Um, COVID hit Detroit really hard early in the pandemic. At the time when COVID hit Detroit, based on reporting by Bridge Magazine, a local news outlet, we know that water was probably shut off in about 9,500 homes in the city. So we started by trying to understand um, where those homes might be located. Um, and because we were um, currently in the middle of a struggle with the water department to get access to shut off data, we didn't have the data from that year to look at. And so instead what we did was took a data set, a seven year data set of uh, shutoffs and we looked at where shutoffs most likely um, occur, which is in the outer neighborhoods. So here you're seeing on the left, this top 10 number of shutoffs um, and then on the right, the top 10 rate of shutoffs, um, which is correcting for population. Um, so those two outlines will show up in multiple maps in this series. Next, we looked at who was really the most vulnerable to water shutoffs and the most vulnerable to public health risks from COVID. Um, and so we were looking at households with children and we were looking um, most importantly for COVID at um, residents over age 65. Um, and so you can see, you know, the households with children is kind of a, a reflection of that sort of hollow donut map, right, where the outer neighborhoods, um, the areas that have the greatest number of households with children are also the areas that are most impacted by water shutoffs in the city. Um, and on the map on the right, you can see that um, really the kind of large majority of residents over age 65 live on the northwest side of the city. Next, we were looking at how COVID played out in Detroit. Um, and so again, this is data from early days of the pandemic from June of 2020. Um, and on the map on the left, um, we are looking at the rate of COVID-19 cases per zip code. Um, and we really saw, um, so that's, that's the green there with the highest rate being the darkest green parts of the map. Um, 
And what we were seeing was that the map of the rate of cases was really kind of a map of where nursing homes were located in Detroit. Um, and you know, we had a really big outbreak in nursing homes in the city. Um, for us, for what we were studying, we were really concerned with cases that were happening outside of nursing homes, right? Um, because nursing homes weren't impacted by shutoffs, um, but many, many homes and neighborhoods throughout the city were impacted by shutoffs. And we were really looking at that relationship. Um, so on the map on the right, we started to isolate how many of those cases were happening inside nursing homes versus how many were happening outside of nursing homes in the neighborhoods in the community. Um, and so the map on the right tells a kind of different story where you can see that on uh, the area of the city that's sort of on the near east side of downtown where there's a high concentration of nursing homes, um, about half of those cases that were registered in that, in that zip code happen inside of nursing homes. If we look now at the northwest side of the city, and remember that's where the greatest number of children, the greatest number of residents over age 65 live, um, you can see that the vast majority of those cases are happening outside of nursing homes in the neighborhood. Um, so the darkest green zip code there had over a thousand cases in the first two months of the pandemic, um, and only a small fraction of them were happening inside of nursing homes. So now we can see uh, this sort of last map overlaid with our uh, shutoff vulnerability map. And we're seeing a really strong relationship between areas of the city that are most impacted by COVID, most impacted by water shutoffs, and that have the most uh, residents who are particularly vulnerable to health risks from COVID and from water shutoffs. Um, and so while this research really doesn't, doesn't show that shutoffs caused COVID to spread um, more rapidly in those neighborhoods, it doesn't show a causal relationship. It shows a correlation, a very strong correlation um, between those two phenomena. And so at the very least, we should be, we should, we should be advocating um, to never put ourselves in this kind of situation again. Um, this is a terribly dangerous situation where we have thousands of homes that don't have access to running water, a global pandemic hits, and those very same neighborhoods are the most devastatingly impacted by these, by these public health impacts. Um, so with that, and I'm happy to answer questions about this at the end, um, I'm going to hand it back to Monica um, to talk about the water affordability pledge and our platform. Thank you so much, Emily, and as always, just an amazing job at helping connect the dots in terms of the historical context of how Detroit got into the condition it's gotten into. Uh, no fault of the residents. It's not people just showing up and waking up one day and not paying their bills, but you're talking about systemic and racial harms that have played out over decades. And one of the linkages we'd like to lift up is the fact that the federal government has been derelict in its duties. When you look at the fact that we're looking at over 40 years of divestment in water infrastructure, uh, that up until 1977, the US government was contributing about 67% of the dollars that went into investing in our infrastructure. And now we're seeing that uh, diminish down to a dismal seven to 9%. And so what happened is that as, as those gaping holes of divestment played out, uh, it went from states shifting that debt and that responsibility uh, to local municipalities and ratepayers. And then the other thing that we saw happen uh, is that we really needed to figure out a way where community was talking together, not just in the silos of their municipalities, but then talking across the region, across the Great Lakes and across the nation and the globe. And so some of that work that came out uh, about four years ago, it took us two years to develop what you see before you is the water affordability platform. Uh, we're so grateful for the work of Freshwater Futures and the funding that came from the leadership of Jamana Vassi and the Midwest Environmental Justice Network and so many others that understood that this was about coming to a common agreement that all human life uh, must have access to clean, safe and affordable water, coming to a grounding in terms of the fact that we know that as more and more water is privatized, we also see the water quality diminish and the rates increase. We also wanted to lift up is that Detroit had been a critical part of being the canary in the mind of what not to do, but also that residents and frontline and most impacted community members had been a major part of architecting 
the uh, policy that we see now play out in Philadelphia and looked at in Baltimore and other places. So we want to applaud Philadelphia and, and Pennsylvania for taking that leap for understanding that an economic uh, pathway for low income families is one pathway to assuring that Americans, we're looking at 15 million Americans struggling with the inability to afford their water. And so we don't believe that this is a pathway that we should continue. And I'll leave you with some of the words that I inherited from my mother. She's a 25 year uh, military combat veteran. She served in the Persian Gulf War. Uh, she's been a nurse for over 45 years, and she told me in 2013, when we were seeing the massive shutting off of water, she said, shutting off water, and then she quoted me the Geneva Convention. She said, you cannot deny your enemy access to water, even in times of war. So if we have already decided domestically that we are going to shut off particular segments of our community from access to world war, then you can already consider those folks casualties of a water war. But what we also know is that somebody has to decide that human life and humanity is more important than sometimes the price point. And I believe that if we'll invest in the technology and green uh, ability to be able to move the country uh, in a way where not only investing in water, but job creations can be connected to the investment in our water infrastructure, we will see a high tide lift all boats. And so on behalf of we, the people of Detroit, I would just like to once again, thank you for inviting Emily and I to share with you the historical uh, content of the work that we've done and also the work that we're moving forward with we, the youth of Detroit and we, the people of Detroit. Uh, we'll take uh, any questions that you may have at this time. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Monica and, and Emily. Um, you know, just seeing some of the, uh, the geospatial portrayals of how um, how race, how poverty, um, as well as how um, uh, municipalities kind of grew out out from from the center of Detroit, and how all of those coalesced, you know, during a pandemic um, to lead to bad, you know, poor public health, um, and and how we can avoid doing that in the future. I mean, that's that's just kind of uh, you know stunning stuff, and I. Um, you know, it, it brought several questions uh, up for me. So, you know, one of those questions was um, in regards to, you know, how we the people of Detroit addresses the communications with um, with citizens. You know, that process is one that a, a lot of groups have learned a lot about over the last year. And, and so, you know, when you're beginning to engage, you know, a community on environmental justice and equity issues, you know, what does a successful conversation look like in, in your eyes? Um, and secondly, how is that conversation initiated in a respectful way? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that, Tim. Uh, I think for we, the people of Detroit, the, the community starts the question. And so that's a different take than I think most people began with. Uh, Emily talked about the fact that many times when we were working with universities and institutions before we established our own research table, it would be the question they had that they wanted an answer to, not the question we needed an answer to. And so I think that approaching it from the standpoint of one, the community's concerns, their questions, things that they needed to have a solution to. One of the biggest things that the research came out of, and Emily can speak to this, was that community wanted to understand why were we being so targeted around uh, the control of the water system? And then why was it so racialized in terms of how it was being talked about outside the city of Detroit? Uh, I mean, you still have today, and Emily showed one of the, the maps, you have a lot of residents in Michigan, even though 40% of the population gets its water from Detroit, they believe Detroit is gouging them, even though there are laws on the books that will not allow Detroit to sell water for any more than what it costs to process, purify, and distribute. Uh, Detroiters are actually paying uh, retail for their own water system while we are selling water uh, wholesale, but the markup is happening at their municipality. And what's happening is those municipalities have found themselves with some budget budgetary holes. 
So now they use the racist narrative of Detroit gouging people on their water to justify tacking on and padding those bills anywhere from a hundred to a thousand percent. Well, Tim, if, if you need state legislators to move policies that are good for the water infrastructure of Detroit, but if you have a significant part of your population that believes that somehow Detroit, Black Detroit gouged them all of these years, it's gonna be extremely difficult to move policies that are good for Michigan, that are good for water and good for water affordability. And so this is why we still have to drive and much of the work that Emily has been leading around the design and visualization is to be able to get folks in the same room, looking at the same information, same data, same research to come to a common understanding for the greater good which is, this is not that we want only Detroiters to have water. Uh, this is why you hear us say, this is about everybody having access to clean, safe and affordable water. Yeah, absolutely, I, I agree with, with that completely. And you know, I think that, that strikes to an initiative that's currently going on in the city of Erie right now. Mm -hmm. and, and in a lot of ways, I think Erie and, and Detroit share a lot of similarities. You know, we're old industrial, uh, towns and areas um, that have gone through many decades of up and then now down and trying to re envision and reimagine themselves while trying to redress some of these issues that, that have come up over the years. Um, but we, you know, from a water affordability standpoint, um, our, our water utility, the, the largest one in the area, um, really provides clean, affordable water um, to our residents. Nowhere even near the prices um, that people are being asked to pay inside of, of Detroit and those neighboring areas. But that being said, um, there are still ways in which we can improve uh, as a community. And one really neat thing that has come up over the last few months is, um, is that uh, Mayor Schember here in, in, in Erie, um, he assembled the Better Together Council. And, and what that did was, is it, it, it reached out to the Brookings Institute um, and Dr. Camille uh, Bousset, who's going to be doing a 12 month uh, exercise in Erie to examine the services that the city provides, its ordinances, and try to really identify those areas that might be uh, contributing to systemic uh, racism and inequality inside of our area and provide recommendations. And so my question to you is, you know, they're going to be looking at these things. Now, in your experience and Emily's and others who are there uh, in, that, in that whole sphere and what you've seen over the years, you know, can you think of one or two specific areas of focus that, that you, you would point to them and say, make sure you really take a look at these and address them? In terms of policies, is that particularly particular policies or in terms of how they're approaching and building with the community? Well, I mean, it, it can be from both aspects, but, you know, specifically looking at, you know, the, the types of ordinances that you've seen on the municipal level, the site, types of land use decisions potentially, um, and, and any other practices that have, you know, stood out as to you as like, this needs to be fixed um, before we even take the next steps forward. Emily, please jump in. I, I think the one that's on the top of my head is the lien, uh, when they uh, actually take the debt and uh, attach it to, to properties and create a lien that will not allow that. Well, what we saw in Detroit, it forced tens of thousands of homeowners into foreclosure. Uh, in 2014, you had 15,000 homeowners in Detroit that did not owe property taxes. They had paid their property taxes, but because they were on a fixed income, or a very limited income, uh, they could not afford the ever increasing uptick of water debt. And so we saw 15,000 homeowners lose their homes because of water debt based on liens. You're seeing right now in Chicago and Toledo, other places, right now Saginaw, is, is, Saginaw, Michigan is on a rapid pace of water, using water liens uh, to drive uh, payment from low income people that can't afford uh, their water debt. Uh, and this is prior to, prior to COVID. Now you have, you know, mid COVID, but uh, I'll step back and allow Emily to, to chime in. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a great point, Monica. Um, uh, other, other things that come to mind for me, you know, I, I think 
there's a way in which you can look at the city of Detroit and because it's so large and such an extreme example of these injustices, you can be like, oh, okay, that's Detroit. Detroit is a mess, but that's not our problem over here. Like we're doing it right. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's not always the right message to take. And I think that, you know, we have these kinds of structural vulnerabilities in every city in America. And we really need to find a systemic and sustainable solution to water affordability that's not based on assistance programs. And that's something that we've had to clarify. We have to clarify constantly in Detroit is that water affordability is not water assistance. We have water assistance programs. They're always underfunded and they're always inadequate. They run out of money all the time and then people don't have access to the funds to help them pay these unaffordable water bills. And you know, we have, we have a kind of really extreme case in the city of Detroit, but every Rust Belt city has the same issue. And so we can't wait for these things to catch up to us and then you know, have no solutions and only be able to think about assistance programs. We really have to think about structural ways to address unaffordable, unaffordable water across the board regionally. This is not just something for the city of Detroit. So that, that's, I think, like one thing that's really important. The other, the other thing is, and this is something that we talk about all the time, um, is, is developing more sustainable ways of managing, managing stormwater, which, you know, there's, of course, like all kinds of really amazing leadership around those kinds of things. I think it's especially crucial for um, historic cities, for urban centers that really are most often hit with the largest impacts of flooding and these kinds of vulnerabilities that are going to be increasing in the, in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we are really interested in taking some leadership on moving forward at We the People of Detroit is um, developing strategies for decentralizing wastewater treatment um, and really kind of helping to support um, people who've been working towards that. I have seen some, uh, some of those ideas um, that have come up uh, on, you know, how do you make this more affordable and, and an investment in the community uh, when it comes to wastewater treatment or stormwater management um, and, and provide, you know, not only the level of environmental protection, but an investment in jobs in the community um, and, and an overall understanding of how these issues uh, directly affect citizens. Hey, I'd like to um, turn it over to the some of the comments, and we've had some questions come in um, during your presentation. The first, uh, the first one I see here is um, the question is uh, from Kim Yagel. For the average monthly cost of uh, three hundred dollars plus, does that include drinking water and wastewater? Is each individual home metered? And have any leak detection studies been conducted? That that would be for uh, the homes are metered, uh, but that still you know you you range from we are transitioning more to a digitized smart system, but you still have some older homes that still have older systems uh, meters in them, and so sometimes we get a guesstimate of what that cost is. Uh, and then the other thing that I would say is that uh, that is including drinking water and wastewater. And 80% of the cost of these bills is for wastewater. Yes. Another question um, that, that came in was that, have you heard about, a, and this is from, I believe, Margaret Taylor. Have you heard about the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition which is designed to cover all infrastructure across the country. And it says here that Representative Danny Davis from Illinois introduced House Resolution 3339 to create this National Infrastructure Bank. Um, first of all, is that something that, that you have heard about? Um, and do you have any, any feedback on that? Um, I don't have any feedback on it, Emily. I don't either, but thanks for the reference. We'll check it out. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll, we'll look into that. Definitely. Art Leopold uh, brings up a question. What top three effective policies have activists been able to get elected officials to enact that have made an actual difference? Well, I, I would say there were several things that we've been able to influence. Uh, when you look at the moratorium, 
that uh, had, was enacted for the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan. That was activists working in tandem, not only at the local level, but the state and federal level, voicing uh, what we already knew uh, that there would be uh, major public health impacts from not having adequate access to hand washing and bathing and cooking. Uh, we saw most recently come out a couple of weeks ago from Cornell University, University and Food and Water Watch where they were able to demonstrate uh, that there were at least 9,000 deaths that they had recorded and documented that were deeply connected to the inability to afford and access uh, adequate water. Uh, and then the other thing that I would say is that uh, what we know too is that we have been able to shift the paradigm uh, four years ago, you only heard water affordability on the lips of activists. Uh, you were, you would be uh, very uh, much uh, in, a, in a situation by yourself to find a utility or anyone in government that would even admit that the United States was uh, directing itself toward this cliff of debt and unaffordable access. Uh, thank God for Dr. Elizabeth Mack sort of sounding the alarm in 2017 with her national research, demonstrating what activists in Detroit and, and Flint and uh, all across the country had been talking about small communities in California, where we know that uh, they really are small and, and, and needing an infusion to be able to upgrade themselves or to be able to consolidate their systems to have the adequate support that they need and access to water. We know that this issue is playing out in the Gulf Coast in terms of where uh, water systems have been damaged due to the levees and the lack of investment in those areas. Uh, we know that on, on tribal lands, uh, those communities are dealing with toxicity and a need for deep investment. So it was really about being able to weave together the stories uh, and the struggle uh, and really take ourselves from being just Detroit. Uh, we are the, the epitome of unaffordable water to connecting our struggle to national and global struggles to say that we are united in this struggle. We're united in our plea for an investment, uh, not just for black folks in Detroit and Flint and Benton Harbor, but also for our colleagues and our fellow Americans in rural parts of the country that are also experiencing uh, these inequities and the, these disparities. And so we're not allowing the issue to be racialized. We're lifting it to the level of it being something that all humanity deserves and that we as Americans must fight uh, in, in order to make sure that the investment is made. Um, you know, Art Leopold brings up another question here, and it kind of ties into what you, you just said. Is it, Does Detroit City have an environmental advisory board? And if so, are there environmental justice projects that are, uh, you know, part of that? I know they, that Detroit, at least as of a few years ago, had a, had a sustainability uh, department that was associated with it. But are there environmental justice projects that are, that are associated with that? Um. I, I know that they have an, an environmental sustainability office. Uh, I know that uh, water has been put on their list, but it has not been prioritized. Uh, you know, it, it really, they have uh, really given more uh, attention to the issues of air quality in the city. Uh, and then also with Detroit being a leader in urban farming, uh, there's also been some attention given to soil quality in the city. Uh, but we don't believe that, uh, that there has been the attention given to water justice and water equity in the city of Detroit because there is no political will uh, in terms of the mayor's seat to really address the issue because he is supportive of the regionalization of the system. And so if Detroiters are able to pay for their water and able to get to a position of improving their credit rating and the ability to invest in their water system, then that would mean that they would want to take back control and ownership, full ownership of that system. And that's, the, that's not the regional desire. The regional desire is to force it into, uh, well, into maintaining regional uh, designation. And also I believe at some point, certain parts of it will be privatized and spun off. And so uh, this really was about a power grab. It's nothing to do with really giving Detroiters uh, clean, safe, and affordable water. It's about who's going to govern and control the water system. 
And, and you know, I'll just say that that's been a theme uh, that we've been hitting on in the Pennsylvania Leaf for for well over a year now is, you know, looking at infrastructure uh, for water, not only drinking water and wastewater, but storm water uh, to assure that those uh, stay in the public trust um, in perpetuity and that um, that through effective and efficient asset management of those those systems that that will help water rates not only now but in the future stay affordable for people and that um, and that they don't we don't run into a situation where those are sold into private hands and then it becomes uh, unaffordable for for you know many of the residents um, so I, I definitely appreciate those uh, those aspects to what your comments were so I don't see any additional questions here, but the, you know, I, I can't wait, Monica, uh, and hopefully Emily, we get to meet sometime in person, but I, I look forward to seeing you again um, across our, our Great Lakes. And I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with our forum today. Well, I can just say on behalf of We the People of Detroit and uh, the great professor, Emily Kudel, uh, we are just so honored to be with you, Tim, and all of the amazing folks at Sea Grant. Uh, and we can't tell you uh, anything more than we found a good fight and that fight is for the human right to water and we're going to stay in it. Thank you so much. And, and please, uh, if you're able to uh, stay with us, um, but if you have to leave, we understand. And, um, and so we'll, we'll move on to a, a fellow um, environmental justice person right here in Pennsylvania. Um, and, and so I'd like to introduce uh, at this time um, our next presentation and um, we bring up our bios. And uh, Allison Anderson uh, Acevedo is the director of the Office of Environmental Justice at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And prior to joining DEP in 2018, Allison served in the policy, advocacy, and nonprofit sectors, supporting and implementing systems change and resource collaboration. She operated in consultancy that provided nonprofit organizations guidance on program development, policy, and strategic planning. She also served as director of education for United Way of Greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey, and as a staff advisor to two PA state legislators. In these positions, <clears throat> in these positions, um, she learned and practiced participatory community engagement and planning. Before working in the nonprofit and policy sectors, Allison worked as an attorney for several years with the US Department of Labor and in a private firm. She's also a founding member of the Philadelphia Black Giving Circle, which advances building a culture of philanthropy in Philadelphia's black community. And so uh, without any further ado, um, I, I uh, uh, introduce Allison Acevedo for her talk here today to uh, give us some insight on how um, we're addressing environmental justice and equity here in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I just wanted to, I see that uh, Emily and Monica maybe hopefully are still with us at off screen, but just was really inspired by the work that they do and just the, all the accomplishments to support community led agendas around justice and addressing injustice, both in water, but many sectors that overlap with the water, like housing, um, this general advocacy and pol politics. So just wanted to um, thank them for their work and their um, commitment and just tirelessness uh, in addressing these issues. So I wanna speak about the perspective of environmental justice from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. So I can talk about what we're doing. Some of the information in the starting point is very introductory, but just wanted to use that to frame around what the where the office sits. And just wanna uh, urge people to think about the work that's happening in the community and then think about how the state is addressing it in Pennsylvania and kind of where we need to move to kind of be Line to or responsive to some of, of the community challenges. So, 
um, I just wanted to talk more about, again, environmental justice in, in the framing of um, the, the Department of Environmental Protection. So I'm going to share my screen and just want to make sure that I have, um, hopefully, not sure if people can see it because, let me see. Hopefully people can see this. And somebody let me know if people, if you can see it. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, thanks so much. Uh, just wanted to, and this is just very basic because we have uh, a department that has over 2000 folks in our Department of Environmental Protection. Part of the, the environmental justice challenge is really thinking about how we integrate environmental justice in our state agency with the employees, with those over 2000 employees that are engaged in a regulatory capacity. So one of the things that we thought that was really important to think about environmental justice and as we do the work is to develop basic framework around environmental justice for our staff. Um, many folks within the um, staff are uh, not engaged in environmental justice routinely. And we felt just as a starting point, it had to happen where our staff got some um, foundational information around environmental justice. And we had a conversation actually in 2020 about environmental justice with our, with our DEP staff. So again, these are base, this is basic information before we get to the environmental justice um, discussion around PADEP. But as you all have heard and you heard from the world, and one of the things that um, I heard Monica saying is that uh, when Tim asked the question of like, where do we start and how do we start engaging communities? It's really having that meaningful involvement where communities are raising the issues and raising um, concerns that happen in their community and government helping to um, respond to those concerns as, as well as the regulatory concerns that we have, but feeling that people are engaged meaningfully in the process. And at PADEP, we actually do not yet have a definition of environmental justice. We created an environmental justice working group that laid out some principles that focus on disproportional exposure to adverse environmental impacts, we have to work on integrating a definition. And um, below, as you heard again from um, Monica and Emily, just hearing the components of environmental justice have all of these justice components um, within them. Uh, the next slide really talks about the principles of equality, equity, and justice. And those um, three concepts, as you saw from the prior presentation, the justice really gets to the systems change and how we address systems change, both as communities and also as institutions. So really thinking about how to, to change uh, the present day inequalities through systems change. And of course, equality and equity kind of move in that direction but really thinking about broader systems change. Just wanted to present this timeline of federal and um, state in Pennsylvania, which is in the red, our framing around environmental justice. So the modern EJ movement, uh, some say, and others have disagreed. I was on a presentation where folks disagreed, started in, 19, in the 1960s in the civil rights um, movement, and then in Pennsylvania, uh, and I'll speak about this more, that our engagement, again, there's dispute to this date, but uh, started formally, some say, in the 1990s in, in Chester around the question of permitting and around the question of um, uh, challenging Title VI, which is a Civil Rights Act around the issuance of permits and whether more permits were issued in Chester than other parts of that county in Delaware County. But in the 90s, there was an initial executive order 
Executive Order 12898 that focused on framing environmental justice and framing the Environmental Justice Advisory Council and some interagency work. And then in, in the 90s, Pennsylvania um, started to talk about environmental justice. We established our environmental justice public participation policy. And at that time, Pennsylvania was in the forefront of recognizing environmental justice as an issue, although we called, focused on, uh, our office was called Office of Environmental Advocate, but then establishing a policy. So we established this policy in 2004. And of course, you see in the 2000s, the California Enviro Screen um, started in 2020 and now is on version four, um, which is a mapping tool used to think about how to allocate resources for communities labeled as vulnerable communities or communities that are typically under-resourced. And then in the 2000s also other, uh, in 2010s, other tools were established to create environmental justice, like the EJ screen, which is the federal environmental justice um, from EPA tool. And then in the recent years, New Jersey, um, Michigan, Massachusetts, other states have issued executive orders. And then last year in 2020, uh, as many folks have discussed, the New Jersey EJ legislation was passed that actually considered cumulative impacts, which means impacts, environmental or health impacts over time in a, of a community in the permit process. So um, in New Jersey, you know, they're working on finalizing the regulations, you can actually um, halt the permit process, we'll be able to halt the permit process as a result of uh, cumulative impacts or impacts of a community over time in certain permitting situations, which is a major advance in environmental justice, um, environmental justice law. Similarly, actually last month, several weeks ago, Washington passed uh, an environmental justice, le environmental justice legislation, which focuses on framing environmental justice in budgeting, in planning of several agencies and really thinking about the impacts of environmental justice and developing environmental justice strategies for a lot of work that happens across agencies and not just in environmental quality. And the Biden administration developed an executive order at 14008, which focuses on a number of environmental justice components, a mapping component, 40% of investments in federal, federal investments going to the communities that are overburdened communities. Um, and that's one of the terms used, but we in Pennsylvania are using now environmental justice communities, but thinking through that process. So this is the this is the timeline. And looking at the historical roots of environmental justice, kind of moving through that timeline also, but just wanted to point out the United Church of Christ study, which really um, was an initial report that tied environmental health issues to um, communities of, of color, primarily low-income communities. And just wanted to mention, because we're talking about Detroit and some of the challenges with housing, challenges with water, just wanted to step back and talk about redlining and structural racism. The Mapping and Equality Project a few years ago released redlining maps, and I, this is I'm highlighting my hometown of Pittsburgh, um, which show the intentionality of the federal government in the 1930s in placing communities of color and oftentimes low income, but primarily communities of color in hazardous locations and locations that were deemed not favorable. So the redlining, really the red areas were the most hazardous and green being the most favorable. And and you can see from surveyor descriptions that the odors and noises from local industries were associated in places where there were infiltration of colored and orientals. And, and reading straight from the, from the uh, surveyor description, I actually went up and looked at my neighborhood in Pittsburgh and the redlining map said that the, my neighborhood was designed for Negroes and undesirables. So just thinking about the intentionality of and it was red, excuse me, just placing um, people of color in spaces that are, are, are deemed hazardous or deemed um, the lowest of the, on the total 
like lowest quality uh, communities. And just wanted to speak on the current impact. So we, the EPA has done some mapping and really shows how the, uh, how the redlining of the 30s has impacted and kind of intersects with communities that um, have challenges today. So they've been able to look at some communities in Pennsylvania to show that the, again, the correlation, as Emily said, not the direct connection of redlining and then uh, connections with hazardous waste sites, redlining, redlined communities and connections with particulate matter. And just talking about disproportionate impacts and how environmental injustice really expands the challenges that people face with the built natural and social environment. So these, these factors come together to create deeper uh, injustices. And um, as we the people explained, really thinking about the data that you can show, I mean, the data that, 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 that um, the, the community data project that uh, Emily discussed was such um, really good news to see that there is data that kind of um, tells a story about some of the challenges that community communities have and really thinking about how to use that data to advance policy. So uh, in Pennsylvania, we're starting to think of that um, as a state, but of course, community groups um, are and organizations outside of the state are, are working on some of the, the data challenges and developing the data. Just mentioning some of the tools around environmental justice, EJ Screen is the federal government tool which really mirrors environmental indicators and democrat demographic indicators, which I think most folks have seen. And just going back to the roots of EJ in Pennsylvania, that Chester environmental risk study done by the EPA really was the, um, in, in the early 90s was a precursor to some of the the lawsuit to the lawsuit uh, with, from Chester residents concerned for quality living in 1996 which which was the beginning of establishing our uh, our office but in that lawsuit as I kind of alluded to before six percent of the folks in Delaware County where Chester was located um, that that were in Chester, excuse me, 6% of the community, the county's population was in Chester, but the, around 60% of, um, of the permits in that county were issued in Chester by the DEP. And residents alleged that the Title VI, which required federal funds to be used in a way that didn't discriminate from one person to another, one community or to another that Title VI was being violated. The case was dropped uh, as a result of a procedural matter, but prompted just because of the concerns raised by the community again, uh, created a 1990 report and recommendations in 2001 around how we should do environmental justice. Our office was created in 2002. There were many recommendations, about 10 talking points about what the office should do. And we focused on Two, about two, two of them, because there were a lot were rooted in cu cumulative impacts. And um, at that point, and still presently, there's not a law in Pennsylvania, there's not an executive order in Pennsylvania focusing on environmental justice or even getting to the issue of cumulative impacts. But just wanted to talk about DEP OEJ specifically is that we have a broad mission in the agency to protect air, land, water from pollution but also to work as partners to prevent pollution. So the partnership piece is really critical. Our goals as created by this working group almost 25, 20 years ago, the report finished 20 years ago, are minimizing environmental impacts and empowering communities. And that one, so we're, we're thinking about how to change some of these because we realize that communities are already empowered where our office can really assist and supporting communities and fostering economic opportunities. So um, those are the goals, which are environmental justice goals in, in themselves, but broadly consider other components of environmental justice, like economic development, economic opportunity, and community engagement. We have, as I mentioned, the EJ public participation policy. So our public participation policy applies to permits we call trigger permits, which our program areas have identified as really critical permits to thinking about uh, environmental health and environmental safety. And um, we 
identified our environmental justice area. So under the policy, if there's an environmental justice area, and then the area of concern is also considered, which is a half mile buffer around environmental justice area, then there's enhanced public participation. So again, this is a policy from developed in 90s, from the 90s discussion in, in PA, but really created in 04 or implemented in 04, but it focuses on enhanced public participation. So it gives people from EJ communities get additional information, additional support from our office and getting access to the process and, and perhaps meetings or public meetings or, or things um, to provide more access to information. We also created this EJ Areas Viewer, which is a mapping tool where you can search by an address and determine whether or not a community is an EJ community. So this tool is used by folks within DEP and then outside DEP also to really talk about whether or not communities are in EJ areas and they get this enhanced public participation. So we realized that enhanced public participation kind of goes so far, really provides people with information about a process, but is not we're not able to, as in some states, provide any, like in New Jersey, provide a framework where we're able to stop the permit process because of cumulative impacts or provide any um, halting to the process even. So we realize that public participation is a piece of it, but we need to push further as a state agency to really think about how we engage environmental justice and engage around environmental justice with to support communities in a way that um, in a way that we know we're limited because we don't have law or executive order or legislation saying that environmental justice is required. So everything with the EJ policy is a policy, it's not required and also uh, not mandated. We ask for instance, um, in environmental justice spaces to in the process when we're engaging with communities, we ask industries industry and businesses who are working through the process of applying for permits to really adhere to the environmental justice policies and policy and often prepare a plain language summary of a project. So most do, but there's not a requirement and we're not able to push folks um, any further. So outside efforts like We the People and outside efforts from uh, our community partners in, um, uh, throughout Pennsylvania are really critical in, in addressing environmental justice because they're just able to move in a space where they could get resources, take resources, get data and take action. So uh, again, in Pennsylvania, the policy is in a space where it's a policy that could be changed. Our secretary is extremely supportive of environmental justice, extremely supportive of advancing environmental justice. However, it sits in a space that's a policy where um, down years down the line where we have another secretary, that secretary could just take away the policy and take away the office because it's not rooted in um, any infrastructure around EJ. So we're in a process now of trying to push the policy further to, to make some changes around the policy to uh, advance it a little bit further or uh, try to advance it a bit further from public participation. Things that we're thinking about are environmental justice and grant making, which actually means we've revised the grant making policy at DEP to require inclusion of environmental justice and we're starting to collect records of how many grants were distributed in environmental justice areas. And environmental justice areas, again, are 30% people of color and 20% low income. Um, wanted to step back and say about a third of the state by population is in EJ area. So we wanted to know, and EJ areas are rural and urban. So in Pennsylvania, rural and urban, but really considering for the grant making, whether or not we're able to provide certain priority to EJ areas or at least consider environmental justice areas in the factor of, of what's considered when addressing grant making, but also to record the data around uh, grants in, in each day area. So that, for instance, our education grants, 87%, um, we know our environmental education grants have been, um, for the most recent year, 
have been awarded in environmental justice areas. But part of it is really continuing to um, engage environmental justice communities about that grant making process. It's a priority consideration for our environmental education grants and then being able to tell the story about the number of grants, um, the percentage of grants in EJ. Also considering uh, institutionalizing and the EJ policy training for environmental justice. While we started, we delivered training to about 1500 folks in PA, uh, DEP around environmental justice. We wanna talk about uh, environmental justice training to other agencies. So we've talked to our Department of Health. We've met with folks in Delaware. We've provided our training to, to people in New Jersey. And we'll be meeting with um, folks in Virginia to really think about environmental justice training because one office engaging in environmental justice when the, the agencies making determinations around permitting community engagement beyond our office um, means that we need to think about how our agency broadly understands and engage around environmental justice. Ideally, we would like there to be no office of environmental justice and environmental justice policies and practices are engaged uh, are included and integrated within um, DEP. So grant making, training, the, the interagency work. So we've created an interagency council, which I'll talk about later, um, thinking about how we can integrate environmental justice if possible in the um, permit process, uh, in the, uh, excuse me, penalties and inspections process to, to consider environmental justice as a consideration there and really thinking about developing tools around environmental justice. So if you can see from the timeline, we wanna have a new policy implemented by 2022. We're in the process of outreach and engagement. And then we're uh, with the process, with the policy now to get feedback. We've had a few informational meetings before we have a draft of both external stakeholders, internal staff, and really thinking about in our environmental justice advisory board, thinking about what other things should, should be included. Um, and then beyond the policy, we want to talk about how we, uh, it's included in the policy, but kind of actualizing what happens, EJ integration, so that we have really deep interagency collaboration around environmental justice, because environmental justice happens beyond DEP. So environmental literacy, so our Pennsylvania Department of Education is focused on environmental literacy and how environmental justice and ensuring that all students, regardless of where you live or what school you're in or what district you're in, understand environmental justice principles and have access, all students have access to um, environmental education, regardless of, of where they are. So our office and uh, collaborates with the Pennsylvania Department of Education and other education partners to ensure infusing environmental justice and equity principles within the framework, how to build uh, build framework for going outdoors or framework for appreciating outdoors if there are limited outdoor space and things like that. Uh, we also work with the um, Department of Health they're developing an environmental health map and ensuring that environmental justice components are included in the environmental environmental um, health map. So that those are just a few spaces where we have interagency collaboration. We started a subcommittee, which DEP doesn't lead, but stem from this interagency work group that focuses on equity and grant making across agencies. So really thinking about how we have more transparency in grant making and how tools that we develop internally are, are, are accessible to people uh, outside of the state agencies and folks who are applying to grants and particularly people from communities that are under resourced. But we work most frequently with health, conservation and natural resources, transportation, ag, education, community and economic development. So at those points, those are the agencies. Also thinking about how environmental justice is included in major initiatives. So the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, a cap and invest program, um, the regulations are being developed. We're making sure that equity issues are at the forefront. We work with community, community organizations and our environmental justice advisory board to come up with equity principles 
around Reggie implementation. And it includes equitable engagement, but also, and I think more importantly, building infrastructure around Reggie investments, investments from Reggie proceeds, which could be um, millions, tens, or even hundreds of millions of dollars, just really thinking about the infrastructure for creating decision-making and design around um, equity, around EJ, around investments for Reggie, particularly in EJ community. So have had a number of community stakeholders involved in that process and really thinking about the infrastructure for investments and making sure that investments uh, move to environmental justice communities in part. And our environmental justice advisory board has been increasingly involved in broader decisions of DEP that the board feels were related to environmental justice. Um, like Reggie, like the boards and commissions and, and diversity around the boards and commissions. And we have a couple of subcommittees, public participation. One of our um, public participation, uh, the public participation subcommittee has done some advising and support around the equity and grant making. So there have been some cross-sectionality around people from community organizations working with our interagency group to think about equity and grant making. Our next EJ meeting is August 19th, 2021. So just wanted to mention that. We are meeting, not last year, the year, year before. I, I apologize because I not remember the years after last year, everything gets um, mushed together. But we, we met in um, 2019, I believe, in Erie um, to talk about community groups that are in Erie that focus on environmental justice. So we were able to, in our August meeting, highlight work of different communities and we're highlighting environmental justice organizations in South Central PA. And one other thing just wanted to focus on real quickly is as Emily um, and talk about the, the community work and Monica talked about community engagement and really community leadership and leading from the community, just really thinking about, and this is not new, this is not new information, but thinking about public participation. And so as we talk about uh, working with communities and working collaboratively with communities, we really have to think about um, how our strategies relate to engaging communities back to that meaningful engagement in meaningful ways. So thinking about how we get to supporting empowerment and supporting collaboration. So we understand and have heard firsthand from um, we the people, just the benefits of community engagement and great relationships, just learning from communities and understanding the knowledge that they bring to the table is really just makes our knowledge base larger. So just really understanding that the lived experience in the experience of people who are in communities um, being exposed and living the things day to day are, are really helpful for us in doing our work. And then when we think about the permitting work, thinking about how to work with communities to build relationships that are unrelated to the EP wants this or we're doing this initiative, but just continuous conversation with communities. So we're working on trying to do that with our staff so, and balancing actually, one of the challenges is balancing kind of the internal piece with being able to work with communities. And I'll show you how our office is organized and then um, just talk about that a little bit more. But we've held nine uh, roundtables with communities over the last couple of years. We started with these listen listening sessions to get a pulse of what happened in communities. And we moved to roundtables to be able to discuss and hear from communities about what their issues were. So we had these listening sessions where communities came and spoke to the secretary and we took, um, we did uh, transcri transcription and kind of heard people talk and then um, just mapped out the issues so we could consider them for the future. And the round tables, our secretary and DEP staff actually talked to communities and heard what they did and then we talked about acting and developing place-based strategies to address the, the roundtable discussion. So in Shemokin, for instance, their focus was on blight. We had the secretary talk about uh, um, how to address some of those issues and actually came back for a tour and worked with Shemokin around some 
around resources for asset mine drainage. Then we also had a $20,000, which was a small planning grant, but it was really helpful. In addition to the grant, DEP was able to provide some resources to uh, the community in, form of, in the form of staff time to, to really support uh, understanding around brownfields, around blight, but the, the grant helped identify brownfield sites in the community. In, um, in South Central, in Harrisburg, their issue was environmental education. And they really focused on developing an environmental teen core program that supported young people in understanding about the environment and developing environmental careers. So we were able to partner with Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, um, Department of Education to really develop uh, both a career piece to have some DEP folks come and talk to the young people, plus a learning module to add to, to, to the environmental team for experience. But that was the, the, the primary issue there. We continue to work with both um, the community educators in Harrisburg and in other folks. And in Erie in particular, our engagement um, was around the um, stakeholders in Erie, originally formed around the Erie Code, but not fully around that. Our prior environmental justice coordinator worked with the, it, to develop and work with community members to develop an Erie stakeholder group to establish a, a group to address environmental issues and focus mostly on, again, at the time, Erie Coke issues, but not, um, not, not solely on that. And then um, also develop an air monitoring system within um, Erie that for a year had 13 sites where there was air monitoring done around the Erie Coke facility. And that was, um, a, a one year follow up, but we still have not had uh, environmental justice coordinator in the West. I've been filling in, some other folks on our staff have been filling in, um, but want to move, we're working to, to uh, start to fill that position again. So want to revive the connections with, with Erie and the Erie community. Another space where we're really active and implementing some integration with environmental justice is climate action planning. So we worked with our energy programs office to improve outreach around the climate action plan and conducted several, uh, several engagement opportunities to have people just hear about the action plan. In Harrisburg, we conducted with our EJAP members actually planned it an outreach and town hall around climate action. And then really the engagement around the communities and climate action planning helped to lay some foundation for including equity and environmental justice in the climate impacts assessment, which is a tool that really addresses um, climate impacts across the state. But thinking about how there, there was mentioned research and then calling out some steps to, to take was the climate impacts assessment included uh, the understanding that communities that are, we've labeled environmental justice communities based on um, now solely based on race and income are most hardest hit with climate change. So um, just calling that out and talking about strategy, strategies to, to address that. So in Philadelphia, for instance, we have a 20 degree difference in some zip codes um, between um, mostly North Philadelphia and Center City, you can often see 20 degree difference just because of the configuration, the extensive concrete and the lack of trees um, also in certain places, but then the increased temperatures through that are a result of climate change magnify that. And then lastly, we wanna think about uh, in our office uh, because we are looking to broaden the scope of environmental justice to build EJ infrastructure across DEP and other agencies. So really thinking about uh, enhanced policy and of, of course are supportive of broader EJ laws, although those are made by the legislature and not us, really and then helping DEP and other state agencies to understand the relevance and importance of, environment, importance of environmental justice across sectors, understand EJ history and really think about the impact of environmental racism in communities to advance systems change and advance justice 
and thinking about how we strengthen EJ stakeholder engagement to ensure transparency and create expanded opportunities for education. So really thinking about broadly um, advancing around environmental justice and um, helping communities get the resources. So using even the mapping data and other resources to, to, to drive allocation of dollars to EJ communities. And this is our office. So we have three people. I kind of help with the rest of Western region, but um, Justin, John, and myself are the environmental justice office. So we have three folks covering the state. So that's it. Um, thanks for the opportunity to participate and just wanted to see if there are any questions. Thank you, Allison. And that's a really good uh, summary as to how DEP has been you know, fitting into the environmental justice uh, topics and sectors, you know, when you, your slide on, on redlining and how um, historical land use has fed in, you know, some of the, the racial inequities and, and environmental injustices of today, I think we're very telling. Um, and it speaks to what the previous presenters uh, have brought up about Detroit and how water affordability is directly uh, influenced um, by those previous decisions. Um, and it kind of struck struck hard for me too, because uh, you know I've, I've been a bit of a student of municipal land use, um, purely through the lens of stormwater management and creating more sustainable developments um, in our communities. And to see that, um, how that has uh, affected, um, you know, land use and zoning decisions for decades. How do you see um, not only DEP but but state government in general begin addressing some of those municipal land use issues that have kind of fed into inequality and 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 injustices? So I think one of the things is. Uh, you know, given the fact our authority around environmental justice is through this policy, really thinking about how we learn from our partners and provide some guidance to state agencies and municipalities. So we, for instance, have um, provided some guidance because we're not able to say, do this around environmental justice or change your land use policies. But we, for instance, some of our staff have been um, serving in an advisory capacity in Philadelphia they have an environmental justice commission. They passed environmental justice legislation on a local level. So being able to um, develop some framework around connecting with different departments, really thinking about using resources or data that DEP has. So DEP has like tons of data and information. Um, just really thinking about how we can address the access to some of that information and make it useful in a way that if municipalities want to take action on their own, they're able to, to do that. The other thing that uh, I think that we do in a way that um, informally, but intentionally actually, is to connect different municipalities who are doing the work. So when we were in Shimokin, we were able to have them have a, a meeting with people in Northeast um, in the Lehigh Valley and have them say, well, Lehigh Valley has done this. Let's have a, a tour. Let's talk about exchanging resources. So if we see things happening across the state, we can actually connect some of the municipalities in a way that um, just because we've done some of the community work that uh, is helpful to, to the municipalities. There's a lot of questions popping up here okay. in the chat for you. <laughs> Hey, I'll start off with one from uh, Art Leopold. He said, there's been success, some success with utilizing local stakeholder groups in EJ areas um, to shape the discussion um, and help add to action for change. Can you address, you know, maybe I, some of those I examples? It. I thank, thank Art Leopold for all his work in the community. I'd say one really directly is that the EJ or the equity principles for Reggie were look vastly different before community stakeholders were um, involved in, in the Reggie um, EJ or equity, equity um, principles. So 
there were some folks, particularly from the Erie area, that um, were valuable in shaping that document and kind of elevating it to being something that wasn't actionable to really st standing for requiring some level of air of emissions monitoring and some level of infrastructure around the investments. So moving it from access only to really being part of um, like something that is tangible to, to be able to, to be included in the um, infrastructure space. Uh, I would also say um, that being, one of the things I think we have to think about is like DEP and government agencies kind of being that second part of our mission, part of a collaboration of people or organizations working on the issues. So in Shemokin, while we led some of the work around planning the, the Brownfields development, really thinking about how we partner with other agencies to kind of, but, but starting with the community, defining the issues and defining the challenges, kind of, um, kind of planning that work. And in Harrisburg, I would say also community stakeholders that have been engaged around the, the climate issue. They really said, we, we don't we wanna see a better framework for climate planning in our community. So the, the climate town hall was a case where the community said, DEP, we want you to come and explain the climate action plan so we can take a, talk about steps that we wanna take and develop a, a framework with the Harrisburg Environmental Advisory Com Committee or Council on, on action. So just hearing from the groups, um, from the diff different community groups and, and certain communities. And we're working with, after our round table, working with um, Northeast PA, like in the Scranton area to um, help them kind of work through uh, environmental justice issues. Because some of the communities, uh, because PA doesn't have like an environmental justice alliance, really thinking about where we can support community groups. Uh, the next question here is from uh, DEP's own Shelby Clark, who works on coastal issues out of the Office of the Great Lakes. And she asks, uh, does the EJ definition have to meet both criteria or can it be also simply low income? She's thinking about those rural areas that are still pri primarily a majority white but low income and often environmentally stressed? Just one. Just one criteria. And that's why there are many rural areas that are, again, predominantly white that uh, meet, the, meet the income race criteria. So it's either one or the other or both. So one or the other. And that's how many of the rural communities that are, are um, predominantly white are included in the EJ definition, just because we, we have, um, some communities because of change in economies that have faced such dire circumstances and really uh, could really benefit from the support of both the office and then participating in some of the uh, EJ discussions. So it's either. Uh, Monica Lewis Patrick brings up uh, another, I think, important issue, and that's, um, and you, you've seen this in Flint uh, as well as in Detroit, the, the relationship between um, local uh, community groups and the you know state level agencies as well as federal agencies. Um, and, and so, you know, what have you seen, uh, kind of your in experience in your experience? Um, that will build a more collaborative uh, type of working relationship between these groups and the state and the federal government? Well, I've been working at the state government for all of three years. So it's really interesting to me how I worked at the federal government actually previously years ago when I was in kindergarten <laughs> in the 90s, <laughs> but I was, I was much younger. But I, I think one of the, the keys is to really establish um, the, the, this partnership. So part of our mission at DEP is really think about collaboration and partnership. So really thinking about how the state views ourselves as a collaborator. So, um, and we're a collaborator with other organizations, with people, with actually business in cases, with academia. So really thinking about how we are collaborators as opposed to we're running things and we're the state. So for me, that's like the, the first thing. And then thinking about building relationships 
that exist outside of asking us to do something, asking people to do something for us. So continuously like calling people, how are you doing? Like building relationships. So it's not always the state asking, asking for things. And I think for us as, as state agency folks to really think about our knowledge about environmental justice, our knowledge about equity, and then our knowledge about what happens at the federal level. So in our EJAB meetings, we're, we're trying. So we're trying with all this stuff that we're in a place where our office has existed, focusing mostly on this public participation policy for years and trying to move away from that as a thing. So, but really thinking about understanding what happens at EPA. So we have people to, to um, we work with people at the EPA and make sure that they're at our EJAB meeting. They helped us design our training. We're like having meetings with the EPA Region 3 and folks at um, central office. So really understanding what goes on as government because some many times people just say, well, this is government. And then really and just aren't, aren't, don't distinguish like we're just government. So really understanding what each other does so that we can make sure we get resources to folks in a meaningful way. And the same on a municipal level, but it's just challenging because we have so many municipalities. Yeah. And would you say that there's a, 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 you know, an ideal way for these groups to request data or, or how to share their data with agencies? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry <laughs> there's so much. I'm like, when I started at, at DEP, I just realized there's so much information, which is often good and like often helpful for the communities. So one of the things that we actually are starting to realize is that I was in a meeting last week where there were three people working on equity things, and we didn't really know about the work that each other was that we were doing. So for us as state government, really think about how we collaborate and then put data that's particularly helpful to communities that have been under resources, under resourced, like in one place. So we're, we've had some discussions with other agencies about thinking about how to do, do that better. Um, and then for, for DEP and our data, one of the things that we think about as the agencies is, is that our agency um, traditionally has not been one that's been overflowing with funding, but really thinking about building data resources internally but anybody in environmental justice communities, if you need access to data, we can, we can help with that. But most of the data, uh, a lot of it is public data. It's just like kind of organizing it and really thinking about how to organize data. But like I said, we we're, we're, had a meeting recently about how to organize equity data, at least in one place across agencies. And we're gonna think about in DEP, we have this EJ viewer in our Office of Environmental Justice, reframing the criteria to really think about other environmental health and environmental um, conditions beyond race and income to really think about how to incorporate a broader definition and, and criteria, kind of get hopefully getting us to the same place, but really thinking about broadening the definition to really include some other factors like um, language access, uh, proximity to hazardous waste and other, other health factors. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing all of this with uh, the forum participants. And, you know, we've had a, ch a couple of opportunities before the forum itself to have conversations. And I, I appreciate those. I've learned a lot in the last uh, roughly month and a half about uh, what you do there and as well as what the EJA activities are going on across the, the Commonwealth. So, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Tim. Thanks for other folks in the forum and, and please reach out with any questions. Take Excellent. Care. All right, so we're gonna move on um, to the, the next segment um, that's gonna talk about, you know, what's the next step? You know, after you have uh, been able to um, have some discussions inside of your community and you realize that there's uh, needs to be met such as, um, you know, climate resilience, you know, how do you go about that planning effort um, with communities that have been marginalized? And so we have a, a, a couple of uh, excellent speakers here for you now. Um, the first is Madison uh, Rodman. She's a resilience uh, extension educator at Minnesota Sea Grant. Um, and uh, her work focuses on strengthening Minnesota's coastal communities, economies, 
and, the, and their environments to better prepare and respond to extreme weather events and changes in climate. And she says in her free time, she enjoys to explore the shore of Lake Superior, as do I if I'm ever there. Um, I can't wait to get back. And uh, her overly energetic uh, Australian Shepherd. Excellent. Um, also joining her uh, after her talk will be Sarah Stallman, who you've met already, the extension leader at Pennsylvania Sea Grant. And uh, she joined Pennsylvania Sea Grant back in 2006 and became the extension leader uh, in July 20, 2017. Sarah is responsible for providing statewide leadership and management uh, to this Pennsylvania Sea Grant Extension Program in several key areas, including water quality, climate change, fisheries, invasive species, waterway and land use planning. Throughout her career, Sarah has engaged with local, national, and international audiences by providing presentations and organizing stakeholder workshops and through the development of successful products and programs. She earned her bachelor's degree in biology and then with a minor in psychology from Penn State Barron. And her master's degree is in biology from Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania. And under normal times, her office would be right down from mine. Um, so hopefully sometime soon, we'll all be back in the office and um, we won't have to Zoom. But uh, with that, um, I'd like to now turn it over to, uh, to Madison to talk about uh, this new initiative, One Block at a Time. Um, community-driven planning and implementation of multi-benefit multi green infrastructure in marginalized neighborhoods across the Great Lakes. Uh, Madison, welcome and uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Tim, for the introduction, invitation, and opportunity to present. Can you confirm that this, my slides are coming through okay? We can see them and they look great. Perfect. So um, like you said, I'm a resilience extension educator with Minnesota Sea Grant and I'm based in Duluth, Minnesota. So that's at the far western end of Lake Superior. And I'm looking forward to sharing a bit more about my work relating to environmental justice and equity here in Duluth and a recent project proposal across the Great, Lake, Great Lakes Basin focused on water equity um, that you see here. Um, but before I start today, um, I want to step back. Allison, Monica, and Emily have set up our presentation really, really well. Um, but as we know, water-related challenges are common news headlines across the country, from frequent to extreme storms, toxic algae blooms, dried out rivers, lakes and reservoirs, and sediment-laden streams. Our Great Lakes communities are not immune to these impacts, and we're um, too experiencing urban flooding, erosion, hazards due to varying lake levels, lack of access to safe, accessible, affordable drinking water, um, water for recreation, and aging and failing municipal infrastructure. Marginalized communities um, due to income inequality and insecurity, structural racism, the historic effects of redlining are experiencing these challenges most acutely, yet often have the fewest means to respond to current and future threats. The one block project that I'm going to tell you a bit more about today um, addresses these challenges by utilizing sea grant programs to provide technical assistance and expertise um, and leadership to support community based organizations, municipal staff and neighborhood residents in building resilience to water and climate hazards. We recognize and ground our work in marginalized communities on these trusted partnerships based on equitable and community driven and community led forms of engagement. The projects I will discuss, um, we hope, will move beyond that typical one-way information sharing to that shared leadership model between the community and local government. And this uh, model includes community member involvement throughout the all stages in life of the project um, and maintain relationships, we hope, beyond the project itself. And notably, these equitable community-driven um, planning um, enhances the co-benefits of implementation activities, such as food production at the same time with recreational opportunities while reducing the risks of, cre of creating or worsening inequalities. And our, our Duluth work here and much of the work that I'll talk about is grounded um, from information from the Urban Sustainability Director's Guide to Equitable Community-Driven Climate Preparedness work, which I'll share a link to later in the chat. Next, I'm gonna share a bit more about our project team, our one block project team um, and its broad goals before describing the work we're doing here in Duluth. So the team that you see here on your screen represents folks from four different states and three different Sea Grant programs. And we're partnering together to develop mirrored engagement processes and projects that address climate hazards, mainly due to the impacts of increased precipitation and urban flooding in four communities across the Great Lakes Basin. 
And they are, as you see here, from west to east, Duluth, Minnesota, Hammond in Michigan City, Indiana, and Erie, Pennsylvania. Each community has its own much larger project team that's not listed here. Um, and this is a project that we recently submitted to the National Sea Grant Office for funding, and we're really hopeful that it'll be successful. The broad objectives of our one block project are to form this multi-community work team, learning and sharing from one another, um, identifying and supporting four frontline and marginalized communities or neighborhoods through the process I'll outline in a little bit, and then to provide educational opportunities for students and professional development opportunities for folks like AmeriCorps VISTAs, and ultimately to develop a toolkit for community engagement and assessment to replicate and scale the process that we describe and kind of develop across the Great Lakes and hopefully maybe even across um, our coastal communities nationwide. So how are we going to do this? And um, we're going to use a tiered approach to expand the momentum and capacity of local partnerships that already exist focused on resilience. It will look a little bit different in each of the communities that I mentioned. Um, it might look different in Duluth than it does in uh, Michigan City or, or Erie, Pennsylvania, but in general, here's our, our approach that we're working on. First, we'll found, um, build this foundation of a background assessment, identifying current community climate hazards um, and vulnerabilities, incorporating data that already exists, such as physical um, and social landscape assessments, flood inundation visuals, municipal planning needs, GIS information, um, information from other environmental justice um, tools and screens, climate trend data, and interviews with community residents and other knowledge holders in our communities. Then building on those background assessments, um, we will use a community envisioning and listening sessions to conduct equitable and repeated community-driven listening and vision visiting sessions with regards to climate and flooding resilience. These sessions will be used to learn from community leaders about their values, their needs, and to prioritize community-supported future opportunities to address local hazards. Um, and we hope they're focusing on green infrastructure projects with these multiple benefits or co-benefits. Data from these community um, sessions will be, when appropriate, um, built into future community plans with regards to climate and flooding. So some of our communities are in the process of developing climate action plans right now. Um, and so our work will help support um, information that can be fed directly into those plans. And when possible, um, and hopefully this is our goal, we'll implement a green infrastructure project, education or training guided and supported by local community needs. So I mentioned this a couple times and um, Tim mentioned it in our introduction. Um, we're, we're thinking about a one block framework. So what is this one block that I keep mentioning? So after the background assessment phase, that foundational phase, we plan to work with residents and community members to identify projects or sites using a ready for rain one block framework. Now this framework was adapted by Minnesota Sea Grant um, and this from the Center for Neighborhood Technologies Rain Ready Approach. This approach was originally designed to address the challenges in the vulnerable Lincoln Park neighborhood of Duluth um, and challenges that happen due to heavy precipitation events and water in basements. This concept pilots community planned public and private green infrastructure um, within one city block area or a similar size that can be scaled up and duplicated across city blocks. And we're really excited about this approach and this framework that we've um, adapted and we're using um, because we believe it is visible compared to diffuse implementation activities that could happen across a city that might go unnoticed by community members. It's concentrated. So all of our activity um, and support from municipal and community leaders is focused on one specific area and there'll be momentum from related engagement and implementation. Like I mentioned before, we're hoping that our projects will be multi-beneficial. Um, so green infrastructure projects can not only, they not only address water um, quality and quantity issues, but can provide things like beautification, uh, recreation spaces, food, and connection to nature within an urban environment. It will be a mix of both private and public implementation projects. So green and gray practices such as uh, rain gardens or gutters address the needs of both the homeowner or renter, um, as well as the general public. Also, they can be scalable. So the type and size of projects are adjustable based on those community needs that they'll be brought forward in those listening and visioning sessions and the composition of different city blocks. And ultimately, um, we hope that they'll be uh, reproducible. So communities across the Great Lakes are able to leverage the capacity to identify vulnerable um, 
communities and challenges in their neighborhoods and address it through a similar block by block basis. So next I'm going to transition a bit more to our Duluth specific work, which will help answer the question of how do we get here and build this approach and submit this proposal to the National Sea Grant Office. So in Duluth, um, here's the title of our specific one block project, but that doesn't quite matter. Um, and this project was a uh, growth from seeds that were planted many years ago through the Great Lakes One Water Partnership. And my Sea Grant collaborators here in Minnesota, which aren't here today, are Tiffany Sprague and Jesse Schomburg. Um, but we don't work alone here in Duluth. I work with a dedicated team of people um, that we've built up and it represents various different organizations um, and entities here in our community. So the local city of Duluth, a local community organization, UDAC, which supports individuals with disabilities, of course, Minnesota Sea Grant, AmeriCorps Vistas, a neighborhood organization um, called Eco3 that's focused on equity and sustainability, serving our marginalized communities, and a community uh, philanthropic nonprofit foundation. And so these kind of diverse groups, we've never worked together before, um, Many of us work maybe one on one on very specific pro projects, but we were brought together um, back in 2019 as a team of the Great Lakes One Water Partnership, or as we lovingly call it, GLOW. And our Duluth or Lake Superior team is just one of seven regional teams that are focused on bringing together place based community foundations and their partners to advance water management. So you might see um, your city represented here on this map, but so there's a lot of different GLOW teams. And all of them have different priorities. Um, some are focused on citizen science and water quality data, like the teams around Lake Erie, improving municipal policies and education, workforce development related to green infrastructure maintenance and more. And from the beginning, our work in Lake Superior was always focused on mitigating the negative impacts of extreme weather on the health and well being of our communities in the Lake Superior region, focusing um, first and foremost on vulnerable and marginalized populations. And our GLOW work led us to develop that rain ready um, one block framework that I shared with you earlier. And here in Duluth, um, which is a city of approximately 85,000 in northern Minnesota, we have and will continue to focus our efforts on one particular neighborhood that we've already identified, and that is Lincoln Park, which is shown here in kind of purple highlight. And this neighborhood is located in western Duluth. And as you see on the image, it is intersected by a large interstate, a highway bordered by an industrial area um, and our port. What you can't see on this map is that it's at the base of a very steep hill and that it's home to approximately 2,600 residents who are not only far more diverse than the rest of our city um, and county, but face nearly double the rates of poverty. In addition, this neighborhood experienced significant impacts from a devastating flood um, nearly 10 years ago in 2012. Um, some of the images I showed earlier today. And our team has been working in this neighborhood um, together with, through the GLOW project and has to date um, built these relationships among municipal staff, technical advisors, and local nonprofits. So we spent the time collaborating, sharing about our, our each and individual missions and values and how we can come together in our work. We have increased our capacity by securing amazing AmeriCorps VISTAs who work with us on their years of service um, to identify the needs of community members in developing rain ready housing, including different financial and resource needs um, and future community partners. We have identified our vulnerabilities in our communities and developed that one block framework. And right now, um, we're excited. We were working on two community based participatory research projects. Um, focused on understanding the residents' perceptions of water and the value of water in their community. And these two projects are already yielding valuable insights and information that we'll use as we work and move forward with our community. Um, so we kind of left our questions open when we asked our community, what do you value about water? And so now we're hearing back from them and that will um, guide our next steps with our community members. And although our work was slightly delayed and changed during the pandemic, um, through GLOW, we have built this solid foundation for water equity work here in Lincoln Park, in Duluth, and across the Great Lakes Basin and beyond. So from this work, if our one block project was funded that I mentioned earlier, we will continue with this tiered approach, the background assessment, the visioning, and implementation that I outlined earlier um, to expand our work in Lincoln Park. And I'll, throughout the process, we'll work closely with partners in Pennsylvania, in Indiana, and Illinois, 
sharing lessons learned for working with our communities to build resilience to flooding. And there's so much more to share, especially about how we'll continue to work with our uh, Lincoln Park communities. But I really want to thank you for the invitation to speak and pass the rest of our time to Sarah, who will tell you about the efforts going on in Erie related to this project. So thank you so much for your time. I'll pass the baton to Sarah so she can start sharing, sharing her slides. Thank you, Madison. One second here. All my Zoom stuff is blocking my controls. Here we go. Okay. Thank you again to um, Madison for providing that really awesome overview. Um, I'm going to have a pretty quick presentation, just building off of what Madison talked about with this one block project and kind of get into a little bit more nitty gritty with what we're doing um, here in Erie, Pennsylvania. And so kind of the, we, we have this overall title of this one block project and, and each of our programs have um, more of a tailored title. Ours is Building Resilience in Erie Through Community Networking, 3D Visioning, and Identification of a One Block Demonstration Site. And so I'm going to just kind of give some background, um, first of all, on um, Crane and the group that is helping to um, implement this project and this work. Um, and I've come on to um, LEAF meetings in the past and given some kind of updates about Crane and what we're doing. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with CRANE, it stands for the Community Resilience Action Network of Erie. This is a group of partners, um, including um, the Erie County Department of um, Planning, the City of Erie, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Regional Science Consortium, um, DEP, the Green Building Alliance, and then most recently we've just added two core members, including Penn Future and the Erie County Department of Health. So this is a really group, uh, a really great group of individuals who have a shared common uh, goal and interest of building resilience to extreme weather and hazards in the Erie region. And we're doing this through um, education and collaboration, ultimately with the goal to identify our vul vulnerabilities and help to think about um, proactive strategies and implementation strategies that can help build that resilience and preserve um, a vibrant uh, region in Erie. So what we're hoping with this project is to build off some of the current work that we're doing. Um, and I spoke about this on our last LEAF meeting um, and in one of the projects that we have funded through GLISA which is the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program out of the University of Michigan. And within this project, we're really working to explore hazards in the community, um, really look at stakeholders' perceptions and concerns with regards to extreme weather, um, look at historical and future climate projection information. Um, we want to implement a coastal resilience index um, to really look at the vulnerable sectors in Erie and assess, you know, priority and risk to those various sectors. And then also, um, you know, take the information that we learn and be able to um, develop this best management guidance document um, called Preparing Erie for Extreme Weather, what to do and where to start. And so one of the things that we've done um, through this project is to implement this extreme weather survey um, for Erie. And um, we developed this, we, we meant to do this in person, but because of COVID-19, um, we were forced to um, do uh, a digital survey, which actually turned out to be a positive situation in that we were able to reach a wider audience of people. Um, we had representatives um, from various sectors, such as agriculture, um, our local marinas, businesses, and grocery stores, um, various municipalities, um, fishing and recreation, and we actually had a lot of residential um, uh, folks to, to fill out the survey as well. And some of the areas of concern that we saw within the survey were things like infrastructure, um, drainage capacity concerns, damages to homes and businesses, uh, energy vulnerability, as well as agricultural impacts. And then we discussed specifically what are the climate variables that we're seeing in the community now and what are we most worried about happening in the future? And we saw things like to be expected heavy rain and flooding, temperature extremes, changes in our growing seasons, snow and ice, wind, and also um, flooding with regards to lake levels. 
But one of the problems and conversations that came up as we were working on this project was really how are we moving forward with this project and other projects in engaging our most vulnerable and often hardest hit communities. We wanna know what struggles they're facing and what kind of implementation projects can help build a safer, more resilient community to extreme weather. And so these are the questions that we had. Um, and and you know, I, I heard about what Madison and some of the folks were doing at um, uh, Sea Grant in Minnesota. And so I reached out and said, hey, you know, we're really interested in figuring out how we can get our um, environmental justice communities and vulnerable communities to the table to have these conversations as we move forward with this approach um, to provide best management guidance on extreme weather and building resilience. And so I learned um, kind of about the work that they're doing. At the same time, this project kind of came to head with um, NOAA op offering this uh, water equity opportunity, which Madison did a great job of talking about. So I won't, I won't be redundant, um, but, Again, I will echo that if funded, this really provides a great opportunity to partner with other communities that are doing this work already, have a shared community vision that would allow us to kind of share and benefit from each other um, at different stages of the process. So kind of one of the things that we noticed with regards to our partners is that we're all kind of in different stages within this. So we talked about the communities in um, Indiana. They're already implementing a lot of these green infrastructure projects within their, their um, environmental justice communities. Um, Madison um, already talked about kind of where they're at. And um, where we're at is a little bit um, behind in the sense that we don't already have kind of these existing committed partnerships through Crane and some of the climate and resilience work that we're doing. And so what we're really hoping to do with this project is to be able to kind of set us up and get ready for implementation with the help of these projects and these partners. And so I just wanna share um, briefly some of the objectives and goals that we have um, in our Erie specific project. And the first is to really, um, as Madison talked about with kind of the background assessment piece, we're, we wanna do something very similar in helping us to really identify the vulnerable communities in Erie. Who are they? What do they look like? Where are they? Um, and, and how do we connect with them and form relationships with them? And so um, this background assessment piece will happen um, and that will look like um, looking at some of what I'm showing here is a, a risk assessment, um, uh, risky neighborhoods um, tool and showing, looking at um, census tract data, looking at some of these vulnerability assessment tools, having conversations. Um, we're hoping to bring in a graduate student to help us um, pull together some of this data so that we have this community profile that really helps us um, identify what Erie County looks like, where are the areas that um, we can connect with and build relationships with. And so that's really our, our key process here is trying to form these initial community connections um, so that we know how to bring these folks to the table. Another kind of piece of this initial kind of phase one step for us is to develop some 3D hazard visualizations. And we are doing this by partnering with Peter Stemple, um, who is an associate professor of landscape architecture from Penn State University. Um, and he has worked in this uh, capacity in a number of uh, coastal and ocean states, such as Rhode Island and Connecticut, to really help develop these models that can help shape conversation and provide a, a baseline. And so what we're really hoping to have happen is um, have Peter work with us to map various regions of the Erie community um, and help visualize some of the hazards that we're talking about, whether it's flooding or whether it's um, looking at other um, potential impacts uh, of concern um, like uh, utility and electrical outages and ice storms and some of the other um, hazards that were mentioned in the extreme weather survey. And so our, our kind of second phase or second objective is um, also similar to Madison's in the sense of having these um, community networking and listening sessions and being able to bring people to the table um, and not walk in and say, here's what we want to do but walk in and say, tell us what your needs are, what your concerns are, what can we do to help you um, and, and really start that conversation and build those uh, trusted connections and relationships with these underserved communities. Um, and so we're hoping to hold a lot of these um, listening sessions, like I said, form these relationships and start having conversations about those types of um, green infrastructure projects that can help build resilience in these communities. And then the third phase of our project specifically is to really start thinking about an implementation plan. 
um, and what that would look like for the Erie community. So in this case, we would really like to identify what our implementation site would be. Um, so, um, you know, one thing is not just looking at maps and data and determining, you know, where these communities are and where the greatest impact is happening, um, but also where we're able to make those connections and, and knowing in the, it, that a lot of these communities are dealing with so many things, um, you know, going back to the first presentation um, with, with Monica and Emily discussing, um, you know, utility shutoffs and not having access to water, um, paying bills, things like that. Th those are all on, on the minds of the, the community members that we're working with. And so sometimes things like talking about um, weather um, might not be um, at the top of their, their mindset. And so being able to you know, have these conversations and work with a community that's ready to work with us so that we can implement this um, one kind of block uh, concept that would be a pilot that we're hoping will spread and will give us kind of more access to do projects like this um, in other blocks and other areas of, of Erie. And so this is really gonna help us kind of plant that seed, set the stage and get us going. And we we're lucky enough to be doing this project with other Sea Grant programs, like I said, where we can learn from the work being done in Minnesota, learn from the work being done in Indiana um, and not reinvent the wheel, share successes and lessons learned with each other. Um, and then as Madison already mentioned, being able to share the results, create this kind of community profile this toolkit and be able to share those results far and wide so that we're able to help other communities as well as our own. Um, and so just a quick uh, kind of project timeline of what this looks like. Uh, phase one is something that we would like to get started um, if we're funded in September. So that would go from September uh, of this year into June of next year. Um, and then implementing those community networking and listening sessions um, from June 2022 into November of 2022, and then phase three, developing an implementation plan and sharing our results, um, November 2022 into January 2023. And I think that is all. Um, so my contact information is there. There's also the pacrane.org website where we're going to be posting um, updates on the project. There's a lot of really great information, uh, eerie specific about um, climate impacts, climate data, um, tools and resources that can be used within communities. It's kind of a nice little one-stop shop for climate information, very specific to the eerie community. Um, and then there's also the Sea Grant website as well, where you can get more, more information. So thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Madison and Sarah. And I, as I was listening to your, the presentations, you know, in a lot of ways, I think Duluth and Erie share a lot in common. Um, it, it, they seem to be similar sized. Um, they have that same connection to water, um, both as a way of life, a connection to the economies, and also have a very strong uh, maritime history in, in both communities. And so, we share a lot in common and um, well, I shouldn't say this, but Duluth would probably be the second place I would live on the Great Lakes if I had a choice. Um, that being said, Madison, when you identified the, the geographic areas um, inside of, of, of Duluth to focus your efforts, what types of things went into that conversation to, to, to determine you know, what the extent of that was? Great. Thanks for the question. And, uh, you know, you should uh, reconsider your Duluth question uh, or Duluth residency based on like February or uh, January weather. <laughs> Maybe you'll take that back. Um, but thinking about Duluth, so we're a really unique community in that we think we're over 25 miles long. Um, so we're a huge geographic range. Um, and back in 2012, as I mentioned, there was this flood where we had over um, six and a half inches of rain over 24 hours following a very wet period of time. Um, and this flood uh, impacted different neighborhoods in Duluth differently based on the topography of our community um, and on um, impervious surfaces. So this Lincoln Park community, this neighborhood that I mentioned, um, has a high level of impervious surfaces. So I think it's over 40% um, paved and um, very steep um, topography. And so it faced um, significant impacts from um, over uh, filled streams and uh, flooded basements, flooded communities. And, you know, we're looking at nine years out and there's still recovery happening. Um, in addition, uh, the, there were some assessments based on different neighborhood characteristics, demographics, um, and 
things like access to uh, nearest grocery stores and um, different proportions of owners to renters, um, along with our neighborhood partners. So one of our um, nonprofits that we work closely with focuses their efforts in Lincoln Park. Um, and so all these factors kind of uh, built on one another saying this is kind of a no brainer for us to start here in this community. We have folks that are working on the ground and have developed relationships with community members. They're already working. Um, there's um, impacts from 2012 and there's likely to be more future um, extreme storm events. There are other neighborhoods and communities we'd love to work in in Duluth. Um, there's a particular community that's right on the lake shore and is experiencing um, significant impacts due to coastal erosion um, and fluctuating lake levels, but the Lincoln Park community for now, um, because of different demographics and past impacts, um, impervious services, the different um, community characteristics that really jumped out at us as the, the place to start. And then hopefully um, we'd be able to expand um, to other neighborhoods in the city as well. Along that, uh, that, that same thought, um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about how your interaction with, with groups over the, the next, you know, roughly six months to a year is going to help um, define the geographic extent of those activities inside of Erie? Sure. So um, I think one of the main goals that we're really focusing on, um, like I mentioned, is making those connections, identifying the community groups in Erie that are doing work in the environmental justice realm and connecting with them. Um, we have a lot of support from the city of Erie um, and, and some of the work that they're doing. They have uh, uh, an AmeriCorps VISTA that they're, they're basically saying, yes, we want this person to work with you on this project. This is kind of right in our wheelhouse and what we're trying to do. Um, and so I think that this is something that, you know, Crane probably should have done already um, and, and inviting to have maybe some core membership and representation from these groups as well. <clears throat> um, and, you know, one of the things that Sea Grant really strives to do is be uh, a neutral source of, <clears throat> excuse me, trusted information and scientific information and, and kind of form these relationships um, without being, you know, a regulatory body and, and offering um, this kind of honest broker approach. And so I, I'm hoping that that's something that we can do um, within our community is to really um, form these really trusted relationships and that we can bring these individuals to the table to share their, their concerns and their issues with us so that we can take the actions to then make their lives a little bit easier and help them um, to build resilience in the community. And so I think that those relationships are extremely important. Um, and choosing a site um, is going to really be based off of those relationships and how that plays out. Um, and, and where we're finding that there's great need, um, there's great impact, um, and there's, you know, the ability to, to implement um, some of these strategies. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see how, um, you know, how the process plays out. And there's, a, there's so much opportunity. I, I know um, on, on Crane, you have representation from, from folks who work at, uh, at DEP on Great Lakes issues. Um, but there's also um, a good opportunity, I think, to connect with our, our environmental justice office um, and, and um, you know, with Allison and the types of resources she might have available too to help uh, feed into that and, and make it, uh, you know, a more inclusive process. So, yeah, absolutely. I was already thinking as Allison was talking and, you know, talking about some of the stakeholder groups, you know, that happened in Erie, I was like, oh, I definitely have to reach out and, you know, see if she has, um, you know, advice and suggestions on who to reach out to and how to connect with them too. So. Excellent. Madison and Sarah, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. I will be following the project um, and I can't wait to see what what uh, good stuff comes out of it. And so um, we'll transition into our next uh, session here as part of uh, the forum. We always give an opportunity um, for the participants to bring up any issues that they uh, may have um, that they'd like others to know about um, or uh, uh, you know, some comments that are on any of the presentations that were made today. And I'll keep my eye on the chat here to see if anything comes up. And of course, another outlet to um, 
to uh, to get in contact with uh, those of us who who host the Pennsylvania Leaf is to uh, again visit the website. This presentation, as well as all the materials, will be available on that website for viewing at a later date. Um, and always go ahead over to uh, Facebook to click like um, and find out about future uh, activities of the Pennsylvania Leaf. That being said, um, looking forward to our next meeting. Um, that is going to be held on Tuesday, October 26th from 1 to 4 p.m. And so mark that down in your calendars and we'll have more information forthcoming on uh, the presenters and topics uh, of, that, uh, of that meeting. One thing that I will note that is uh, some of the uh, water quality and water use um, agenda items will, will um, uh, be on that agenda, um, as well as uh, some updates from science in and around um, Presque Isle Bay and Lake Erie here in Pennsylvania. So I don't see any other questions on our chat. Um, so again, I thank all of our presenters uh, for a, a very rich discussion today. Um, and I look forward to, uh, to the next time that we're all able to get together. And so until that time, um, be well, and uh, we'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks, Tim.